So, thank you everyone for watching or listening. Liam Hartry here today with another episode of Presenting Champions. Today, joined by an absolute legend of the fight game, Marvin Eastman, known as the Beastman, who has competed extensively in mixed martial arts and kickboxing as well. Uh, has competed for multiple of the best promotions in the world, including the UFC, but also King of the Cage, where he was super heavyweight champion, Shuto, Maximum Fighting Championship, and many others. Also played football for the CFL and as I mentioned has competed in kickboxing in both the Muay Thai and K1 styles. Absolute legend of the fight game has been in there with some of the best competitors that you can actually be in there with with MMA and uh, today we're going to be talking about his life journey. Now, just then I was just giving a quick intro of your many career achievements um, to our fans watching around the world so I was just giving a mention obviously to the kickboxing, the MMA um, all different things, the world titles that you've won. So, um, you know, that's a real quick overview. Um, I mentioned obviously King of the Cage is obviously the IFO championship in there as well that you won. But getting into it a little bit, and at any point if you can't hear me, just 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 say, talk to us a little bit about your life in 2022, right now in 2022. You know, some of the things that you're up to these days that fight fans around the world might not be familiar with. Let's start with the present day, and then we can work back in time a little bit. Well, um, I'm retired from the fight game. Obviously, it's been I haven't fought since uh, about six years, seven years, and uh, I just recently opened up my own um, uh, MMA gym. It's called Legend Mixed Martial Arts, and uh, I was with I was training out of Syndicate. Um, John Wood for a while, but my original gym is um, was uh, John Lewis. Uh, it was uh, our JSEC jujitsu, uh, and then it turned into Fight Capital after uh, my uh, my former manager took it over. And um, but the let's see the the direction kind of went a little bit south from where we were trying to do after I started ending up my career so we kind of they kind of went more boxing and not so much mixed martial arts so it didn't behoove me because I had uh, amateur fighters and stuff like that um that I was training uh my kid and some other guys and stuff like that so we had to kind of we kind of nomaded for about three or four years and um and then kind of made our way to syndicate MMA. And I was over at uh, John Woods for a little while. And then um, I kind of, when we got the opportunity to open up our own gym, it's kind of, uh, I can teach the way I was taught. Um, our jujitsu is uh, Nova Unyal, it's John Lewis, or, um, but we catch can wrestle, you know, we submission wrestle more so. Um, we want to control from the top um, submissions. We don't want to go have to do 15 different moves to get to one, one to submission. We want to be able to attack you and uh, submit you with, with our wrestling, with the dominant position being the most keen. It's kind of um, Khabib style. He, he dominates you with the wrestling and then our, or what you want to call it opportunist jujitsu. It's like wrestling. And then when you see an opportunity to take a submission, you get it not necessarily fall into your back and waiting for something to happen or, you know, an opportunity, you know what I mean? So, um, but it gave me an opportunity to, to teach or uh, to, to implement the Muay Thai, which was my foundation. And I kind of got away from it uh, and started just doing more striking. But uh, when I implemented my Muay Thai, um, you know, because I'm a traditionalist, my, my, I was taught by Thai teachers from Thailand that only spoke Thai. So it's not Americanized and it's not watered down. It's this version of that. It's, it's a hundred percent from the Orient, you know, so that's the way I stuck to it. And, uh, when I started doing that, every fight that I had like that, and I just used pure wrestling and, uh, pure Muay Thai, the fights were easy. Um, when I started trying to change and do like everybody else, be more striker and abandon what made me a good fighter, um, 
you become vulnerable and you become easy to be able to be uh, picked apart. You know, any fight that I had where I took people down and used my Muay Thai, the fights were just easy. But like the second fight I had with Rampage, the first fight I had with Rampage, all I did was use pure 100% Muay Thai and, uh, and I used wrestling. I didn't even know any submissions. I had no, I just had a wrestling background. Multiple years, I started wrestling at seven, freestyle, Greco-Roman, folk style. And uh, that's all I did. Um, and the fight was easy. But when I started becoming like everybody else and wanted to be striking and want to be, I, I, it, it made me play into being like everybody else, just like everybody's calf kicking right now. But you see people getting their feet and hands and legs broken doing that because it's not a traditional style. It's it's bad. And it'll eventually uh, fade itself out. Um, you'll never see a Thai person, nobody in Thailand doing calf kicks because it's not Thai. It's it's something else. But, you know, if you try to Thai kick, I mean, if you try to calf kick a Thai fighter, they'll check you and you end up breaking your leg. Um, but, you know, it's fad and that's what people try to do. They do what's popular. But you'll never you'll never see a Thai person kicking somebody's calf. They'll trip you. Um, and they'll block with their shin bones, but they never calf kicks. It's, it's not something that we do. So all I did is got back to the basics, got training my guys, 100% Muay Thai, and um, catch can wrestling, which is submission wrestling, and to dominate from the top. So I opened up my own gym. It's called Legend MMA. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And I think the fact that you're giving back, you know, to the new generation coming through is an incredible thing. And I've got a lot of respect for that, you know, given everything that you've achieved in the sport, you've achieved so much, which leads me to the next thing. Obviously, I think it's time to look back in time a little bit. Now, with this, obviously, you've had so many fights that, you know, we could talk about and really there's too many to, to get into them all. So rather than going fight by fight, I'm going to look at this a different way. And look at it in your own words. When you look back on your career now, whether this is MMA or kickboxing, because I know obviously there's the two sides to it, do you have particular fights that stand out that you're the most proud of when you look back now, your favorite fights for any reason? And I know this is this is quite a big question because you had so many. Obviously, there's world titles, there's fighting the best of the best in the game, like Rampage and many others. So it is a big question, but at the end of the day, um, I love asking this question because you never get the answer you expect from from champions, you know, um, which is very cool. So in your own right, words, right. looking back now, which fights are your favorite fights from your career? Which fights are you most proud of and why, please, champ? Um, it, it's funny because I've had some great fights and then I've had some no so so good fights. Like for some reason, I did I did good. In every other organization that I ever fought in, but for some reason I just had a, it was like I had a UFC jinx. Uh, uh, I fought in the UFC five times, and I think only two times of those fights that I have. Uh, hold on, you mute with yourself. Yeah, if you tap the screen, hold on, because uh, I can't hear you. Tap the screen, and in the bottom left-hand corner, there we go. You're back sorry. now. Yeah, there you go. I'm sorry. Um, my brother called me. I'm sorry. I'll call him back. Um, I always had something happen. You know, like one of the best fights I ever had is the first world championship that I won. Um, I was on a four-fight knockout streak, four or five knockout streak. Um, and uh, the Fertitas had been trying to get me to sign – with the UFC for, for a while. I was one of the reasons why I didn't sign him initially um, is because me, Tito and Chuck, we all trained together when we first started. Um, I helped both of them multiple times train for world championship fights. Um, when, when Chuck fought um, Kevin Randleman in, in pride, um, for eight weeks, he trained with me um, because we had similar body types. Um, just take him down. All they did was double leg and take him down, take him down, take him out. Because me and um, Kevin Randleman are very similar, you know, 100%. He's one of my good friends. 
And uh, but it was before because we were kind of rivals. But uh, so I helped him train for that. Then he goes to Pride and he ends up. I mean, he goes uh, and not Pride, but he fought him in the UFC and he ended up knocking him out. But um, and then back and forth multiple times with Tito helping him for multiple fights. Um, but we all trained pretty much together because uh, John Lewis and um, Chuck Liddell were best friends and John Lewis was my uh, my manager. So he kept me in other organizations so we'd never have to have to bump heads. But then after Tito and Chuck kind of had it out and wanted to do their thing, kind of all split up and started training separately. So it didn't matter anymore. But then into then, uh, um, you know, I was fighting in other organizations simply. So I never had to bump heads with the guys that I used to train with. And, um, but, um, you know, one of the most devastating fights I ever had was, uh, the first world championship I won against Alex Steveling. And he was called the Brazilian killer. Cause he was in pride, just submitting all the, Br the Brazilians. He was just, you know, that was his nickname. And, um, so I had an opportunity to fight him in the WFA and, um, you know, it's kind of running his mouth, talking a little bit of crap, but it's what people do. It's not a big deal, but I'm not, a, I've never been a smack talker. So I just think it was a little bit disrespectful. And I just kind of went out there and I kind of obliterated him in about a, a minute and 15 seconds just with, you know, one punch knockout. And uh, and then that kind of catapulted me kind of finally where uh, the UFC came knocking again and the the belt was vacant. And um, so they gave uh, me, Chuck Liddell, Randy Couture, and Vito Belfort the opportunity to fight for the belt. But uh, – my training camp was, was ridiculous. I had a great camp training with all my guys, but, um, <laughs> and it's like, I, I just have the worst luck in the world, but I had some, um, some super, super personal at home, uh, issues. And, uh, just, just know that it, it, it carried over. It, it was pretty, I mean, it's the kind of stuff that that uh, that people go <laughs> go on killing sprees or go go shoot up a building. I mean, shoot up their job or something because it was that personal. Um, it was just hit real close to home, just super personal. Uh, you know, personal family old lady problems, and um, so you find out that kind of news right before you fight for a world championship. And I was a zombie. My mind was gone. I was like, totally, you, you just don't go into a fight like that. Just anyway, it's super personal, but it just was, uh, um, but not my wife. It was my girlfriend at the time. And it just was, you know, if you can think of the most unspeakable thing that you can do before you fight, uh, that's what I did. And so, you know, my head wasn't together. and got my head split open. Um, so, you know, most people remember that cause of the cut, but, uh, every other organization I fought in, I, I always had, it, it was like, if people could see the fights that I had in other organizations, I know it would be a huge star if I did that in the UFC, but it was not on the same stage. So it doesn't really matter unless you do it on the big stage. But for some reason, I just had a, a terrible jinx. Uh, fighting in the UFC. I think I had one fight where I didn't have an issue. Um, you know, and that was with, like I said, the, the second fight with Rampage. But, um, oh, no, I think, no, Terry Martin, I didn't have no issues. I think the Rampage, the second fight with Rampage, I lost fair and square, and um, and I fought Terry Martin. But the 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 third time I fought um, Travis Luter, um I was training with Tito Ortiz to help him. Uh, he was going to fight a uh, guy Metzger and uh, me and him were training together for eight weeks. And then they found out guy Metzger had a heart problem. So first thing that UFC does is says they offer me and Tito to fight. So man, we can't fight each other. We've been training together for eight weeks. I've been helping him with his fight. So they tried to offer it to us, but um, then they end up getting um, uh, the, the cat from, um, He's a Canadian guy. I can't think of his name. And they gave me uh, Travis Luter. Well, 
in that fight, and I know I'm going long term, but in that fight, um, we was doing double legs, double a uh, double leg takedowns, and I was taking Tito down, taking him down, taking him down, and uh, he kind of got frustrated. So what he did is he jumped guard while I was shooting. And it hit me in the head and it knocked me out. Um, you know, old school time, we just get up and start training again. So that's what I did. Got a concussion, but I didn't know it. And then about two days later, we're doing a drill called the 21s, where you have a different partner every minute. We did that for 18 minutes. And then at the 19th minute, they put in another guy and uh, he kicked off the fence and knee me in the head again and it knocked me out the second time. Uh, full knockout. I just got up and kept on playing. Well, guess what? We go into the fight and I go and I'm fighting Travis Luter, is a, which is a wrestler. I mean, he's a jujitsu guy. And uh, he throws a little punch and it barely touches my head. And I go to sleep and like people think I took a dive. I, I didn't realize that I had a head, I had a concussion, full of blown concussion from two knockouts training. But we weren't smart enough to recognize that I shouldn't have been fighting. So people was, oh, my God, he took a dive. They thought I actually took a dive. You know, like, no, I had a concussion. But, you know, I didn't tell anybody and we didn't get it. I got an MRI later and then I realized, oh, they, this guy was fighting with a concussion. He should never have been cleared. But, you know, it was too late. So, uh, you know, no, no excuses. And you go in, it's your, it's your responsibility to, to be on point. But um, then my last fight in the UFC, I uh, can't even remember the kid's name. First thing he does, you know, the, you know, kind of John Jones sticks his hands, fingers out, kind of the fingers. Well, first thing he did is he threw a punch and he sticks his hand out when I retreat and pokes me in the eye and it tears my retina. First, first thing. And then he did a jump knee and I picked him up and slammed him, but my whole retina was tore. And uh, he starts hitting me on the side of the face and they end up stopping the fight. Well, it tore my whole retina. Um, so that was my last fight in the UFC. It was like, man, you know, if anybody, I was like, I had the worst, worst luck in the world. Not all the fights that I had outside. If I had some of those great fights in the UFC, it would have been a big deal, but it's part of the game. You know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, you know, I'm, going around complaining to everybody, but it's, you know, uh, and plus, hell, I'm a, I, I retired as a officer from the North Las Vegas Police Department. So while I was fighting, I was going back to the job, dealing with people in the jail and on the streets. You, you don't get a day off. You have to, you know, I retired from the police department 25 years. So, you know, trying to be a full-time fighter and be a, uh, have a career job, which is like, Law enforcement, like I said, I just retired five years ago. Hell, um, nobody, who, you tell me who's really successful having a full-time job like that. You know, Forrest was a police. He he, he had to stop. Uh, Rich Franklin was a teacher. You know, um, Stepe, Stepe is a fire de- fireman, but it's different with the fire department because they give him, they give him opportunity to, uh, to do his thing. But for me, the police department, I didn't get an opportunity. It's like, Hey, this is a, it's a privilege when you have a second job, which the fighting was considered a a second job. It's not a first job. Your job priority is your, as an officer, I was a a North Las Vegas uh, officer, corrections officer. So that job comes first. They have to give you permission to be a fighter. So you know, when everybody else goes home after they fight, guess what I'm doing? I'm putting on my uniform. I got to go to work. You know, when I had that cut on my forehead, you realize I had to get 21 stitches and, and, and the next day I had to go back to work. You know, can you imagine all the inmates and all these people seeing you with your head swole up with stitches in your face and you got to go to the job? So that's kind of <laughs> it's the way of the walk. You know, I didn't get to take two weeks off. I had to go to work, you know. So anyway. I'm sorry about the long soliloquy. It's just, you know. Well, no, actually, you know, champ, it's actually really cool because do you know what's cool about it? And even though there's the highs and the lows there and everything, it gives people what the fans don't see. Do you know what I mean? And that's something I really aim to get into with these interviews. People see the fight, but they don't see the behind the scenes. They don't see, you know, what's going on, good and bad and mixed and whatever. 
And, you know, even that with the cut and everything, it's such a famous fight, but like the story behind it, I didn't know that. You know, I think a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't know, and several others that you mentioned, I knew about your work and everything, but even then, you know, I didn't know you had to go straight back in. So there's a lot of clarification there. It's, it's very honest um, of the highs and the lows. And really, and that's, that's good, man, because it's from the heart, you know, and it covers right. like the high points, so you had plenty of those, but it covers the low points as well, um, which right. is a question. I was going to ask you anyway, you know, which which we obviously we've covered right. that. Very cool. Going into another question, though, you touched on something there that I also think is is overlooked with, you know, the fight game, and it's it's overlooked with uh, with this. It's obviously the mental side of, of competition. You mentioned that going into one of the big fights, there were some problems going on. It messed your head up a little bit. In a normal situation, how would you mentally prepare for a fight? We've talked a bit about the physical training. But you know when in fight week or on the build up to a big fight, what is the sort of mental process you would go through? Would you sort of visualize the fight? Would you put it out of your mind altogether? You know, you get where I'm coming from. I don't think people talk about this enough, to be honest. And I don't think it's, it's something people realize. You have to have a strong mind uh, as well as a strong body. And especially with doing what you were doing, working as well. You've got to be mentally tough as well as physically tough. So. Walk us through, you know, your mental game, like in fight week, on the build up to it. What were you feeling? What were you thinking? What was going through your head in on the build up to big fights? Well, preparation for that one, you know, for for me, um, I some fighters they get out of shape and then they have to get in shape to fight. I never did that. Um, I trained. I worked. 10 to 15 hour job, you know, at the police department I work for from nine at night to seven in the morning. I'll get off at seven in the morning, uh, take my kid to school at eight o'clock. I sleep from eight to 1030. Then I'd have to be at the, at the gym to train uh, Muay Thai or, or um, my pad work or jujitsu in the morning from 11 to one. Then I'd leave there, get something to eat, go to uh, UNLV, and I was trained with uh, at the boxing team, and I'd we'd spar, box, and condition from from three to five. I'd leave there at five o'clock, go to the gym, and train Muay Thai from six thirty to eight. Um, shower at the gym, come home, take uh, pack my lunch, and I'm back at work. I did that for eleven years. Eleven years. And then coaching um, my kid, my youngest, my my youngest and my middle guy, uh, they were wrestlers. They they wrestled freestyle, folk style, and Greco-Roman. So I took them all over the country, all over the, uh, Nevada and California and Utah, and they wrestled freestyle. So I did that on the weekends, um, and I did that for multiple years, but. You know, when this guy say, I can't do this and I can't do that, you know, it's a mentality. You still have to had to work. You know, you still have to have a family life. you got a girl. you got to take care of the stuff at the house. You just make the adjustment to either this is what I'm going to do and no excuses. Because a lot of people say, well, I could have did this, but I didn't have this to do. You know what? For me, I knew that I had to work and my – uh the stuff that I did on the side was secondary. So I'd sleep on my lunch hour. I'd sleep in my car. Um, and most of the time I caught up on my sleep on my days off. But there were some days that uh, I got forced to work overtime at the, at the police department. And guess what I had to do? Instead of getting off in 10 hours, I worked 15 hours. And you know what my, my training would stay? <laughs> Soon as I got finished, come to the gym. Only person you're training with is me. You train with me for an hour and then you go home and you go to sleep. It's just the mentality that you develop. And I guess the money wasn't as big at the time. So you had, you made thousands and you can make tens of thousands. And there was one or two guys making a hundred thousand here, there, Tito and Chuck, those guys was right there. and right there when you're making 40 30 50 thousand dollars and stuff like this but there was no conor mcgregor's and hundred thousands and millions of dollars in pay-per-view it wasn't it barely was legal you know so 
I had a I had a job making six figures. You think I'm gonna drop my my professional job of six figures to take uh one or two, three fights here, a thousand here, two thousand, five, ten, twenty thousand. Hell, I only made fighting rampage thirty plus thirty. That's sixty thousand dollars. And they make this, you got you got these guys starting making thirty thousand, forty, fifty thousand dollars, thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars is nothing. So, you know, but a lot of those guys that was fighting with me, if they didn't put their money away, they'll have no career. You know, what do they what do they got? You can't fight at 50 and 60 and 40 years old. Nobody wants to fight you. And there was no YouTube fighting Jake Paul and stuff like that. So so I did what I had to do. But I mean, hell, if there was Conor McGregor money and pay-per-view and all that stuff, then I might have made a different choice. You know, I mean, hell, one or two fights like that, you can retire, you can do what you got to do. But one other thing that I think is a big deal is a lot of these guys are taking all these fights and taking a lot of punishment because they want the money. But you got to realize, hey, you're not going to be 20. You're not going to be 30. You're not going to be you're not going to be that age for long. And if you don't take care of your mental health, uh, CTE is a big deal. These guys are getting beat up now. I mean, if you look, I love uh, these, these guys that were tough. You're this and that. But hey, um, next time you get an opportunity, listen to some of these old school guys talk. CTE is a big deal. These guys are they're making these fighters fight five five minute rounds for main events you know what i fought five five minute rounds for belts three or four or five times when i defended my belt in other organizations that's when i fought five minute rounds but now in the ufc they're fighting five minute round main events and these guys are tearing their heads off to make the money to get the bonuses because they ain't making a lot of money if you look at that reebok contract that they had they ain't making the guys back in the day, they could make, you could have 15 or 20 sponsors, 5,000 here, 3,000, 10, 15. You could make 50, 60, $70,000 off of having eight or 10 sponsors. Well, guess what? If you know what that Reebok contract that they used to have, that's by, it's it's based off of how many fights you have in the UFC. How many uh, um, Donald Cerrone's, you guys, got 25 and 30 fights. Well, guess what? You get one plus one, two plus two, three plus three, four plus four, and you got to have multiple fights in the UFC to make money. That Reebok contract ain't giving them no money. You know, they're not making no money off that. So if you don't make any money by getting knocked out of the night or submission of the night, uh, you ain't making no money. So you got to have a second job. That's why you got... Jake Paul talking about pace, pay bigger. I mean, Bellator, they, they're doing good and you'll see they're making some money, but the the, the base guy that's barely starting, he ain't making a lot of money. He's not making a lot of money. 10,000, 5,000. That's why these guys got to beat each other up to make some money. You know, if you, how many uh, Conor McGregor's you got? How many John Jones do you have? How many got? Not that many. It's a whole bunch in between. But one or two fights you lose, guess what? You're out. And they got five, six hundred fighters in the UFC. So if you if you think if you ain't performing, you ain't making no money. And I'm not hating on the UFC. They a, they're a business. But the UFC markets the UFC. They don't market fighters. They they market the brand. The brand is gonna be there no matter what. You know what I'm saying? Conor McGregor will retire. Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz, they were tired to be going. It's going to be somebody else to take their place. But the UFC and its brand was going to be there. And their objective is to make money. So the smart fighter is going to do like he's going to get all the money he possibly can without taking a beating so he can retire and he can have a – Conor McGregor is hella smart. He made $100 million taking a boxing match. He ain't ever got to fight again. He's doing this because he, because he wants to, not because he has to, but – how many of those guys do you got out there? Very few, you know? So I know I went on a rampage about this stuff, but uh, that's why I'm trying to do it with my fighters, I'm trying to make them, I make them fight smart. You beat these guys up and you, and you make as much money as you possibly can and you get the hell out the game, you know? Yeah. But you know, it's good advice though, man. I mean, one of the things I love about what you're saying there is it's really good. It's, it's actually good advice for the next generation coming through as well. 
So I know you went through some of the hardships there, but turning that into a positive situation um, as best you can and passing that along, um, I think it's fantastic in, in that way, you know, making something out of it, if, if you get where I'm coming from with that. And, and right. you, can, you can advise people from um, the things you got right, but also the things that were more difficult. And, you know, seeing the changes in the sport, that was a question I had for you anyway. I mean, obviously, we, we've covered that. But um, I'm really glad that we got to get into seeing the sport from, from what it was to what it is and the pros and the cons of that because there's both, you know. Um, so getting into uh, getting into a couple of other things, um, you know, the last couple of things really because I, I keep this to about about an hour, so sort of by 2 p.m. Gotcha. for you, you know, we'll, we'll sort of wrap this up. But um, obviously people always want to know about toughest fights because that comes up in like every interview I do, you know, whether it's boxing, whether it's MMA, whether it's kickboxing, whatever it is, you know, you said earlier about, uh, well, you were talking just now about making the right amount of money, people being tough, this, that, and the other, but nobody can dispute that you are a very tough individual, um, and obviously a very skilled individual, I'm not limiting it to, to just being tough, but it was still a factor in your career, you know, your, your toughness. So. When it comes into toughest fights, um, whether that's in the kickboxing, whether that's in the uh, MMA itself, you know, it'd be good to sort of cover both. And tough, just before we get into this, can be obviously in different forms because it's not always the hardest hitter, you know, sometimes it's the most technical, yeah. sometimes it's an entirely different thing. Obviously, sometimes it's what you were saying earlier about what's going on outside of competition, that, that's tough. Right. Sometimes in many forms, you, you get what I mean. But in your own words, who would be, you know, the toughest fights that you had in your career? Uh, obviously, uh, Rampage, uh, super tough. He just was like a rhino. I mean, you know, only way you're going to get him out of there is to basically shoot him because he's just tough. There's some guys that you just ain't going to knock out no matter what you do. Um, uh Honestly, I have a couple of fights that I wish I could have did over. Most definitely, um, I would have loved to have fought Belfort again because I didn't fight him in the right mental state, you know, and it's other stuff. But, you know, like I said, hey, I, I, it's my responsibility to make sure I don't have personal problems going on. You know, um, uh, Glover Teixeira, I fought. Fought him in Brazil with no corner, um, no elbows, no slams, and no corner. My my corner didn't come. I went to Brazil by myself. Uh, no no slams, no elbows, and it was in a boxing ring, a fifteen by fifteen boxing ring. Um, you know, it was tough because because I had no corner. Just I, I was by myself. You know, and he was. He was knocking everybody out over there too. So, um, hold on, it's muted again. Basically, um, there's too many. To me, um, oh, I fought to, um, um, what is his name? Um, Ricardo Arona. Same thing in Brazil. No mm -hmm. slams. Uh, no slamming, no elbows, and and I actually I had a corner, but it was it was limited to what we could do, and uh, I actually had him knocked out in the second round, and they they stopped me from finishing him, and uh, so I end up losing to him the decision. But he was tough, but you know I was always was, oh the jujitsu is so great. I was like man, I trained with. People who had greater jujitsu than that, he couldn't hold me down. Whatever, I'd never been, you know, I didn't really have a problem. But it was he was tough, obviously, because he was a good opponent, you know. But to me, like I said, uh, toughest got toughest guys that I ever fought. Like I said, is you know, uh, Rampage, you know, Travis View, um, even Jason Guida was tough. He just was tough. Uh, but unfortunately, when you take those kind of beatings, like I said, when you get older, you know, you're going to need to you're going to need sticky notes to remember where the hell you at. Those people that it 
some of those taking those beatings and stuff like that is is great for the it's great for the fans, but and it and it makes you a lot of money. But man, you got to remember, my last fight in the UFC was at 37, bro. I'm 53 now. You know what I'm saying? You got to have your faculties. These taking all these beatings. If you think about this, and I'm not hating, but I just want these guys to remember, Brian Ortega. You seen some of his fights? This guy gets. They get beat up, they get cut up, and they and it and it looks tough. And it, oh, this guy is tough. He's tough. He's tough, man. Thirty-seven in the UFC wasn't too long ago. Now I'm fifty-three, and it's like nobody can imagine that they're actually going to get old, and they're they're not going to be able to do this anymore. So if you don't have your faculties, what good is all the money in the world? But if you can't remember what to do with it, or if you can't spend it. You know what I mean? You want to be able to be able to have your faculties to enjoy that money. You know, especially these guys have used use steroids and use substances and stuff like this. It's like, hey, you know what? All that's great, but eventually you're not going to be uh, uh, top notch anymore. So now your body has to function. So, you know, you, it behooves you to think smart. I, I think Mayweather was a smart fighter. I don't care what you what you think about him. The dude's smart. He's got all this money in the world. He never took any beatings. He's 50 and 0. And you could say, oh, yeah, he he whatever did whatever. But the dude's smart because what good is all the money in the world if you can't even remember what to do with it because uh because your faculties is gone. You know, these if you think about these fights, they're doing five, five in a row. You look at Julie, you see Juliana Pena last uh uh got cut up pretty bad. You know, these guys are. They badgering themselves. They're getting beat up. And it's great for the fans and it's great for the um, organization. But you got to remember, self-preservation is everything. And like I said, what good is being a billionaire if you can't remember what to do with the money? Our objective is, is to get as much money as you can and be healthy so you can enjoy that money. Because honestly, the fans will love you when you're winning. But I'm telling you, if you don't perform, or remember Muhammad Ali, everybody loved him, but he was walking around with Parkinson and he's shaking and he needs help. It's great. He's going to be remembered for being a great fighter, but he's always going to need help. So to me, I say the best thing that I can tell you about being a, a great fighter is, is always self-preservation, protect yourself, make sure that you can come out of this thing and you're good because like I said, it looks great. He's leaking. He's the best. The, the trainers love you. Everybody loves you. But eventually, you know, you'll be forgotten and somebody else will come up. You know what I mean? So that's the only thing I don't like about this business. It's just these guys are taking too much punishment now, you know? So, and I don't know if that answered the question, but, you know, it's a big concern for mine. And my fighters, I got a fighter right now named David Jordan. His, his nickname is KO because he been doing, we having a hard time getting them fights because he went 16 and 0 as an amateur and went pro. And his first three or four fights, he got taken with small decisions. And then when you get a whole bunch of losses on your record in the beginning and then you go on a knockout streak, all they see is those first three or four losses, even though you won five or six or seven in a row and your, your record doesn't reflect how good of a fighter you is. But trust me, when I tell you the fights that he's got on his record, he's my business partner. And I'm talking about, remember how when you would fight, you would watch Mike Tyson. If you came to his fight late, you probably won't see the fight. Well, guess what? That's what this dude's been doing. He's been one punch knocking these fools out. His name is David. K.O. Jordan, he's been sleeping. I'm talking about the last person that he knocked out. He knocked out um, Randy Couture's uh, uh, grappling uh, coach. One hitter. They took him out in a stretcher. I mean, in a stretcher. One hit. Um, and the last couple fights he had, knock out one hitter, going to sleep. Not 15 punches. One punch. Sleepy sleep, you know? So, that's what we want. We want our, our thing to be, and but at least if you you take a punch like that, it's not a lot of damage. It's boom, you get hit, you go out, that's it. But now these guys are getting cut, eyes hanging out, they batter, and they, oh, there's a great fight. It's a great fight, but he's got a concussion, and, next, and 15 fights later, he's got CTE, and now 
he's damaged for later on. So that's the only thing that concerns me about the fights now, you know? It's amazing. I mean, it's, it's very, very honest again. Champ, we're com coming to the end of this because I'll have to wrap this up shortly, you know, with, uh, okay. with, time, with people's attention. Like I was saying, by 2 p.m., i, I got to come off because I keep mine to about an hour, you know. There's some people out there who do great interviews, you know, like two hours long and things like that. But you think in a working day, you know, who's got that much time to, to sort of watch something so or listen to something? So I try and keep it to, to like a few highlights, even though I know there's so much more we could get into. I mean, I'd love to talk to you more about the kickboxing and challenging right. for the world. Muay Thai and some of your best finishes and there's so many other things but still right. we've some good stuff because we've gone into some deeper stuff as well as just the fighting you know like the nature of the sport as it is now versus as it was the mental side you know advice for young fighters because when I put this out I'm going to put it out all over the world so obviously you know your advice can then be passed on a little bit um, not obviously it's not all of it but there's a few golden nuggets there that are really really good Moving into the last thing, what I like to close out with these interviews and, and sort of wrap them up with is, is, is about the fans because we've talked about other fighters. When it comes to the people who supported you during your career or they continue to support you now, even, even if it's on social media or if it's from distance or if it's in person, what would you say to those people who were sort of loyal to you and, you know, give you any form of positive encouragement? What would you say to, to some of those people out there, if there's some of your fans from around the world watching this or, or listening to this, what would be some words for them, please? It's a great sport, um, you know, but I, I wish that eventually would come around where, you know, I, I like what these, these fighters are trying to do, trying to get these guys some benefits and some, you know, because you got so many haves or have nots. You guys got, you got, it's, there's not a lot of guys in the middle. They're either at the top of the food barrel or they're at the end. Not too many people in the middle. So for me, I think about the fighter and I say, always do what's best for you. But then also look at some of the fans and they might see a guy and they look, and this is not a, this is not an easy sport. I mean, I mean, it takes, you know, they used to call us uh, ballroom ball, uh, brawlers and stuff and not skilled and stuff. This takes a lot of skill. It takes multiple years to learn how to do it. And, uh, you know, it's funny when you hear a guy, oh, this guy's fighting. He got knocked out. He got this. I'm like, man, the first time I ever stepped in that cage, I was in a boxing. I was in boxing rings for multiple years. But I got locked in in that cage with Rampage, a little small king of the cage cage that was small and it's a fighting cage and it makes you fight and all these four or five thousand fans around here yelling and screaming and stuff and if you don't do what you got to do you're out of there man so it takes a lot of heart to be able to do this stuff and it's not for everybody you know but um i just wish that sometimes people would before they start saying this guy punked out and this so this guy sorry he got knocked up they would take two seconds to actually go and see what it takes to actually do this. Um, and then they would have a different appreciation for the guys who get in there and, and train and do their thing. Um, but it, the sport is growing, it's getting bigger. And I'm appreciative of the fact that, you know, we got some pioneers that actually was able to uh, initiate it and get these guys where you can have a Conor McGregor, you can have a um, uh, John Jones and, these guys to make millions and millions of dollars and represent it to represent it the right way, man, you know, but because there's a lot of guys that still working nine to five jobs and Hey, you find the UFC, you can have one messed up performance. You sign a five fight deal. They don't like you. Guess what? It's a wrap and you on your own again. And, it's, and there's not any competition. It used to be pride. It used to be, um, Strike Force. There used to be all these other organizations that you can go to. Well, guess what? The ones that you're going to make any money is only going to be Bellator and it's going to be UFC. There's nothing else. So if you don't make it, that, I mean, it's a lot of haves and have nots, you know? So, so that's why a lot of, you got a lot of guys that still got regular jobs because the money doesn't um, suffice enough for you to be able to take care of training expenses and health care there's a whole bunch of stuff man that's what said for me i had a, a job and a bachelor's degree 
to go to school. So fighting was secondary, but I did it 100%. Now, I, I wonder, I always wonder how what I did if I only would have been a fighter. I know I could have did better if I could only donate, I mean, uh, dedicated to one sport, but I had to do both. And, you know, to be able to say I won world championships and four in the organizations and full of, be I have a full-time job, I'm still still proud. But I wonder what would have happened if I just only was a fighter, you know. But, you know, I, I got no regrets, like I said, but I'm just thankful that you got these guys now that's holding it down, just be smart enough to, to get all the money that they possibly can because, trust me, the ride is short, you know. And eventually you're going to have to give it up. I just want guys like, Brian Ortega and those guys like that, Robbie and stuff, that's my homeboys, to make sure that, hey, you know, this is shelf life, man. You don't want to be taking all that damage, man. You want to knock people out, get done with it, so you can enjoy that money later on because it's good for the fans. But trust me, homie, uh, you got baronies, you got guys like that, uh, you know, a lot of wars, but guess what? Hey, uh, it ain't us. You know, V tours. Guess what? Now it's all over. You, it's a whole bunch of stuff. You got to What you're gonna do after after fight life? You know. So, anyway, and like I said, for me, I got a career. I, I opened up my own gym. Um, I got a college degrees and stuff like this. I'm I'm retired, so I'm getting. I'm doing what I enjoy doing. Open up my own business and training fighters. Uh, but I already did my thing. I still got a retirement income that's coming into my my pocket regardless if i don't do anything or not even if i don't make any money in the gym my money comes every month regardless you know i ain't a millionaire but i ain't broke <laughs> you know so anyway hopefully it'll get better and hopefully i'll get a world champion out of my gym soon i got quite a few guys that i think that's gonna do something for me so but be aware of david ko jordan he's coming coming through pretty soon okay amazing well, Champ, I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. We've gotten into some really good stuff, honestly. And I know, like I said before, I know there's always more. But what I'm happy with about this is we got the message out there. You know what I mean? We got, like, the bigger picture of, you know, fight life. And, and I think that in some ways is equally valuable, maybe even more valuable than some of the fight stuff. I mean, don't you know, we've got some good fight stuff we talked about. But I'm really happy there's the bigger picture in there. So um, right. I really, that. really appreciate your time. Definitely, Thank you. Uh, you know, we'll keep an eye on everything you're doing with the gym and everything like that, and the fans around the world, keep an eye on what this man is doing. There's some big things happening by the sound of it, so very, very exciting times. And uh, I just want to thank you for your time, say enjoy the rest of your day, and um, yeah, just thank you for everything, man. It's much appreciated. Appreciate it. Holler at me anytime, bro. My, you know, you got my Instagram handle, is Beastman MMA, and my gym is called Legend MMA. Hopefully we get some guys coming out of here pretty soon. Like I said, you'll be looking for David K.O. Jordan, either Bellator or UFC pretty soon. Um, and my, I even have a junior, his name, he, he goes by some other crazy name, but he's Marvin Eastman III. He's actually pretty rough too. If I can get him online, he can start knocking some people out again too. So, but feel free to hit me up anytime, man. I appreciate the love. I appreciate everything. Okay, thank you. Absolute pleasure, man. Thank you very much for watching um, please subscribe to the simply inspired youtube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon